Um, again, like Georgia, what I'd love to hear is the feeling amongst the Jewish community in Israel, this terrorist attack. Um, and I just want to throw at you what Georgia said three hours ago, which really resonated with Nick and I, when she said the real horror of this weekend is that it begins creating echoes of the past for the Jewish community. Yes, uh, the mood is very much like that. In fact, um, some secular Israelis are, are posing some very deep questions. They're saying this is the country that was established with the guarantee to keep Jewish people safe uh, following the horrors of the Second World War. And here we are now, we're facing some of the worst attacks we've seen uh, in in the past 50 years. Um, the mood on the streets of Tel Aviv is still very, very somber. There are more, a few more cars out on the streets, but everything is still closed. Kindergartens and schools, shops are open. Um, the shelves are pretty empty as people are stocking up. The Home Run Command issued a, issued a recommendation to people saying to stock up on food for at least three days, to have a flashlight, to have a, a radio with you. So pretty grim prospects all around. Whereas in Gaza, um, in Gaza the situation is also very very dire. Um, as, as you know, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that he will impose a full siege on the territory. It's a tiny sliver of land. There's really no not many places to hide. Mm. Um, Netanyahu also told the residents of Gaza to get out of Gaza, those who can through the Rafah crossing into Egypt. Um, and uh, but I understand 180,000 uh, people in Gaza have been displaced from their homes at the moment. So it's pretty grim all around. Emma, in Tel Aviv, where you are at the moment, um, do you feel a sense... What's the advice been given mm. to people in the local area about how to respond to an air raid siren, for example? Yes, well, uh, the the drill for the air raid siren is well known by everyone in this country because having been through uh, so many wars uh, since since uh, many years, many decades, so everyone knows how many seconds they have to run to the bomb shelter in uh, in Tel Aviv. It's about, it's about uh, ninety seconds. Uh, in areas close to Gaza, Gaza, it's really ten seconds. A uh, very very short amount of time. Uh, most people, if they don't have a bomb shelter, they try to go uh, stay with relatives who do uh, have a bomb shelter in their buildings. Some um, what is remarkable now is that families also in the north of the country are being told to take take cover, stock up on foods, and uh, residents in the north, uh, close to the border with Lebanon, have been told to um, to stock up and spend the night in their shelters. So it's really affecting almost the whole country now. And um, these are the provisions. That this is what everyone is dealing with right now. It's uh, there is some panic. There's a lot of fear, particularly amongst people with with young children and others and elderly who are afraid to go out on the streets in case, not just because of the rocket fire, but in case any of the Hamas fighters, mm -hmm. I think about between 800 and 1,000 managed to get into Israel in recent days in case they are hiding out and uh, are ready to commit some kind of an attack somewhere nearby. I mean, I, I, it, Inna, I'm so grateful for you joining us. Mm -hmm. We sit here every day and we talk about news and then something like this happens and the reality, just pick out a line you said, 90 seconds to run for your life. It's 2023 and people in this country are moaning because they can't see a doctor. I'm just being realistic. 90 seconds to save your life. Um, in terms of being there in Tel Aviv, you've talked about the horror, the shock, the fear. What about the response of the, the community, the world community? Have you, our Prime Minister straight up saying he supports it, calling Hamas a terrorist group, um, which it is. Um, have the Israeli people been buoyed by that support or do they want more? What do they need and expect? Yes, uh, it's been very heartening uh, to see the support from around the world and particularly the UK, of course. But uh, everyone is wondering what's what's really going to happen next because Israel's options are all bad. Let's let's think about it. What what's what's the best thing to do in Gaza? If you negotiate with Hamas, um, they they are estimated to hold about 150 Israelis hostage right now, if not more. Now, in the past, there's been one Israeli soldier who was held hostage in exchange for about 1,000 Palestinian prisoners. If you if you try to exchange 150 people, it's a it's a very very big blow. Uh, would be a very big blow for Israel. Other options are imposing this full siege on Gaza, which would re re result in a complete humanitarian catastrophe in that tiny sliver of land. Mm. And then the other option is a ground operation, air operation, which again would result in a massive loss of lives on both sides and catastrophic consequences for both. So it's it's really devastating to see that there are no good options right now. 
And this I'm, I'm saying without looking at the northern border and seeing what happens there with Hezbollah, if there is going to be an, an eruption of hostilities and eruption of rocket fire and so on from there. Inna, from your perspective, how much is this a war apparently between two states on how much is it a religious war? Mm. What role does religion play in the, the events of the, the past few days? Religion, of course, has uh, always been used as a justification and will always continue to be used. But uh, from, from my side, I think it's a very much a real politic kind of situation. Hamas uh, acted very strategically, uh, very smartly from their perspective. They managed to take Israel completely by surprise. And this is coming from, you know, a guerrilla force in a, in a semi-besieged uh, uh, part of the world, you know, with very few resources, uh, of course, funded by Hamas, but mm. nonetheless. Um, it's a it it's it, it's a, a religion is used is used as a justification, uh, but behind it a very very somber, very clear headed uh, planning that is based on uh, the the fact that Israel was deemed to be vulnerable. As you know, Israel uh, has been Israelis have been protesting out in the streets for the past ten months of the year. Um, the uh, the society as a whole has been deeply divided. Thousands of reservists have said they're not going to show up for military duty due to some of the judicial reforms that Mr. Netanyahu's government has proposed. And so uh, Israel's enemies have taken this as a, as a sign that the country is vulnerable and in, indeed they caught it off guard. So Can I, can I just ask you one final question, Ina, and so delighted to have you on talk today. Um, you said completely by surprise. You've talked about the security and surveillance systems. We've talked about Netanyahu being unpopular because of those judicial reforms and almost with help Hamas finding a moment and striking. Has this very simply and very quickly hardened the Israeli public behind Netanyahu or are now more questions being asked about him than this solidarity against Hamas? What's the answer to that? I think overall the country is united. Many people want to volunteer, but if you look deep inside, many people are furious and are starting to turn even against one another, religious communities versus secular, uh, those on the right versus those on the left, pointing the finger at each other and saying, you're responsible. So there are still deep, deep divisions within Israeli society, but on the whole, the whole country is, is of course bound together by this tragedy.